I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Welcome to the Watchman YouTube channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, as if the pandemic wasn't enough, the universe now has another curveball for us. Get this, there's a giant asteroid heading toward Earth this Saturday. Now, it's the size of, about the size of a football stadium, so that's pretty big. The good news is, though, it won't hit the U.S. The asteroid is called 2002 NN4 and it's hurtling in our direction at about 20,000 miles per hour. NASA says it'll stay about 3 million miles away. The seven year tribulation is fast approaching this world and the news headlines prove it. God in his grace and mercy is trying to shake the world out of its complacency. We are currently living in a time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. Jesus is likening last day's events to a woman in labor. The closer we get to Jesus' second coming, last day signs and calamities will become more frequent and more intense. Following the rapture of all true Christians to heaven, the Bible warns us that the wrath of God will be poured out on an unrepentant world. One of the judgments described in the book of Revelation includes a massive asteroid impact as we read in Revelation 8, 10, and 11. Then the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. All our lights are shaking. I do feel like uh, we are having a, a bit of a... a it felt like an earthquake. Tremor for sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm right with you. Um, I'm sorry, it just took me by surprise there during this yes, newscast. Right. I thought, am, is everything okay? Yeah, I thought the same thing. I thought the table that I, I was at right now, it was a little, it's normally a little bit wobbly, and then I looked up at our studio lights, uh, and I felt it shaking. And remember, it's, this was the same feeling we had 4th of July and, and the July 5th of, of last year, is the same kind of uh, feeling when, when the... the entire room uh, was shaking. All right, well, we felt it here in the studio. Danny, I don't know if you felt it. KBC is reporting out of Los Angeles. A 5.1 earthquake has hit in Ridgecrest. Uh, Ridgecrest, of course, we felt earthquakes yeah. there be before July 4th right. of yes. last year. Yeah, and, and Danny, we were together right to July 5th of last year when something similar happened. Mm -hmm. Almost exactly 11 months ago, this uh, USGS actually just upgraded it to preliminary 5.5. So originally they said a magnitude 5.1. Now they're saying 5.5. I felt it here in my apartment. I immediately jumped on USGS waiting for that update. Psalm 18.7. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken because he was angry. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Jesus, speaking to his disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age, declares this in Matthew 24, 12. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The Bible tells us lawlessness is the violation of God's commandments, as we read in 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin will be so rampant and so commonplace in the last days that the love people once had for one another, for many, will be non-existent. In this prophecy, Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. 
This is what we are witnessing in our world today. The FBI is investigating whether an attack on NYPD officers in Brooklyn might be tied to terrorism. It was actually one of two attacks targeting police overnight. CBS 2's Lisa Rosner reports from Flatbush. Flatbush Avenue suddenly rocked by a stabbing and gunfire on police Wednesday night at 11.45 p.m. The NYPD says two police officers were on anti-looting patrol near Church and Flatbush Avenues when a 20-year-old man casually walked up and stabbed Officer Jean-Pierre in the left side of his neck, missing an artery. The stabber then allegedly stole a gun from Pierre's partner and shot two other responding officers in the hand. The mayor says the officer who was stabbed is an immigrant from Haiti who became a police officer so he could serve his community. The mayor says all three injured officers are expected to recover. The suspect was shot multiple times and is in critical condition at Kings County Hospital. It is absolutely unacceptable to attack a police officer in any way, shape or form. We will not tolerate it. There will always be consequences. 22 shell casings were collected and body cameras are being reviewed. The FBI was on scene and says it is fully engaged. We respond as if one of our own was attacked and we will use every federal statute available to hold the perpetrator accountable. I just feel that it's very sad that this is happening in our neighborhood. Sources say the suspect lives locally, has no criminal record and no ties to Antifa or white supremacist groups. Detectives are checking his social media, overseas travel since he is an Eastern European native and whether he's associated to anyone with a terror link. It is unnecessary violence. My, my stepdaughter is a police officer. I fear for her safety. A fear validated as hours after the Brooklyn incident, a 55-year-old man menaced two officers inside a Lower East Side convenience store with his knife and shoved one of them. He was shot by police in the torso and arm and is in stable condition. The Apostle Paul in his epistle to Timothy tells us in the last days society would be in a total immoral meltdown. 2 Timothy 3, 1-5. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. It's all gone. Looters attack a high-end car dealership and make off with nearly 80 vehicles. That's a looter burning rubber as thieves have a field day at this Dodge dealership in San Leandro, California. Oh, he stole it, y'all. Yeah! That's right! And here's where they drove the car right out through the showroom floor. Dealership owner Carlos Hidalgo says the looters drove off with nearly $2.7 million worth of new cars. These are collector's cars. I have customers from all over the United States that buy these. What a shame to see what it came out to be. And this is how the looters were able to make their getaway. These are car safes. They hold 240 keys. So they got to the first one. And from there, they went looking and seeing which one would beat the alarm. We're there as a tow truck driver recovers one of the stolen vehicles. It was located with a tracking device. 40 vehicles have been recovered so far, but many have been stripped for parts. No engine, no transmission. On the night of the looting, video shows a police vehicle at the scene, but officers were clearly overwhelmed. The whole city was under siege. Other car dealerships across the nation have also been hit. You can see the boarded up windows behind me here in Santa Monica. They lost a dozen cars here. Meanwhile, at other dealerships, like one across the street, they've actually transported most of the cars off the lot in case the looters returned. Mike Sullivan owns 12 dealerships. They stole a total of uh, between 10 and 12 cars we're still ascertaining. They crashed cars into each other. They ran them into gates. <laughs> And just when you think you've seen it all, look at this guy using a forklift to break into a Best Buy in Northern California. Crowds run off when cops arrive. <laughs> she will always be remembered as a large name. With that smile, oh my God, that smile. If you didn't know her by her name, if you knew her by her smile, like, oh, I know who she is. But no one will ever see that smile again. Elijah Nae Davis was killed Saturday morning. She was just 16 years old. I have a lot of questions. 
not enough answers. Davis's mother, Brandy Thomas, says she knew her daughter went with friends to this gas station at the West Side Shopping Center. Police say an acquaintance offered them a ride home. As they drove in the 2100 block of Wilkins Avenue, a gunman opened fire on the car, hitting Davis and the driver, who continued driving to St. Agnes Hospital. It's sad when it comes to somebody, you know, being gunned down in the streets of Baltimore. Nobody sees nothing, nobody hears nothing. And that's sad. A show of fury in Guadalajara against alleged police brutality. The arrest and death of construction worker Giovanni Lopez a month ago has caused controversy and conflicting accounts in Mexico's second largest city. Police say the 30-year-old was detained for disturbing the peace. But this video shared widely on social media provoked protests. Not far from the city, bystanders identify the man being shoved into a vehicle as Lopez. They say police were using excessive force and that he was arrested for not wearing a mask. They're mandatory to prevent the coronavirus spread. Police say he was taken out of his cell for medical treatment and died hours later. The police deny brutality but protesters are demanding accountability. While some use batons to smash police vehicles, some police officers pick up whatever they can to fend off protesters. One policeman had petrol poured over him and set on fire. The governor of Jalisco State says video of Lopez's arrest doesn't show the reality. The government minister for human rights accuses the police of using excessive force, saying it's a clear violation of human rights, and he's condemning the events in which police use force for preventative measures. Protests have swelled across Mexico in solidarity with George Floyd's death in the United States. But many Mexicans are also dealing with their own issues with police where they live. Human rights groups have collected years of evidence of police brutality, torture and extrajudicial killings. And protesters in Guadalajara says what happened to Giovanni Lopez is the latest example of that and they're demanding justice. One of the many signs that we're living in the end times is the epidemic of wickedness and violence that is sweeping the world today. Jesus tells us when society parallels the days of Noah, he will return as we read in Matthew 24, 37-39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So what was going on in Noah's day that parallels our day? To find out the answer, we need to go back to the book of Genesis 6, 5-13. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God, and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. There is no doubt about the hour in which we live being the season for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ as we link Matthew 24, verses 12 and 37 through 39 with 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. The Bible describes our day very clearly from these scriptures. The condition of wickedness and violence that caused the earth to be destroyed in Noah's day is the same condition our earth is in today. For the past week, all of us have seen chaos engulf our beloved country. The violence and the destruction have been so overwhelming, so shocking and awful and vivid on the screen, that it's been hard to think clearly about what's going on. What is this really about? What do the mobs want? Well, if thugs looting the Apple store can't answer that question, they have no idea. They just want free iPads. But what about Apple itself and the rest of corporate America, which is enthusiastically supporting the rioters? 
What about members of Congress, the media figures, the celebrities, the tech titans, all of whom are cheering this on? What do they want out of it? Now suddenly, it is obvious. It should have been obvious the first day. This is about Donald Trump. Everything is about Trump, everything. Donald Trump defines their friendships, their careers, their marriages. Donald Trump affects how they raise their children. Trump occupies the very center of their lives. As long as Donald Trump remains in the White House, they feel powerless and diminished and panicked. They cannot be happy. In everything they do, their overriding goal is to remove Donald Trump from office. And that's exactly what they're trying to do now. That's what these riots are about. The most privileged in our society are using the most desperate in our society to seize power from everyone else. They are not seeking racial justice. If they were seeking racial justice, they wouldn't be denouncing their fellow Americans for their race, which they are. It has nothing to do with it. What they are seeking is total control of the country. And it goes without saying that none of this has anything to do with George Floyd. Shame on those who pretended that it did. Those who fell for the lie and those who knew better but played along because they are cowards. Meanwhile, the many promoters of this chaos remain clear-eyed. They are not lying to themselves. They never do. They know exactly what's going on and they know what they hope to achieve by it. With every night of rioting, they grow bolder. Now they are openly defending violence on television. People are worried about the protesters and the looters. And it's just people who are frustrated. They are frustrated and they are angry and they are out there and they're upset. You shouldn't be taking televisions, but I can't tell people how to react to this. I'm proud of the protests and um, uh, I think it's part of the tradition of New York. The violence is bad, reprehensible, should be condemned, but it is not the overwhelming picture in New York. Destroying property which can be replaced is not violence. Too many see the protests as the problem. Please show me where it says that protests are supposed to be polite and peaceful. You're crushed by this. You can't believe it's happening to your country. But for the people you just saw, the real problem is that the rioting in some rare places is being stopped by police. And their aim is to fix that. They would like to eliminate all law enforcement for good. Today, Democrats in Dallas took down the statue of a Texas Ranger from the terminal at Love Field that had stood in the airport for more than 50 years. The Texas Rangers are cops, and cops must be removed even when they're made of bronze. Meanwhile, the Lego toy company has ceased marketing sets that contain plastic police officers. Apparently, they're too dangerous for our children. And so on. So much of this going on right now. If it all seems like yet another episode of the silly and fleeting hysteria that sometimes grips our culture out of nowhere, usually in lulls in the news cycle, you should know that it's not that. This is entirely real. Brian Fallon, who was the press secretary of the Hillary Clinton for President campaign in the last election cycle, tweeted, quote, defund the police. Congressman Rashida Tlaib agrees. Expect more members of Congress to agree soon. In some places, they're not talking, they're acting. Steve Fletcher represents the third ward in Minneapolis. He's on the city council there. By this week, his city had been completely scorched by riots. At least 66 businesses were utterly destroyed by fire. 300 more had been vandalized or looted. Fletcher didn't even mention that. Instead, he attacked the city's police department for trying to contain the violence. Quote, several of us on the council are working on finding out what it would take to disband the Minneapolis Police Department, end quote. You'd think people in the city would be shocked by that, but at least on the city council, everyone else nodded their approval. In the ninth ward, Councilwoman Alondra Kano tweeted this yesterday, quote, the Minneapolis Police Department is not reformable. Change is coming. According to City Councilman Fletcher, all nine members of the City Council are now considering getting rid of the Minneapolis Police Department. Hard to believe, but it's not just there. In the City of Los Angeles, Mayor Eric Garcetti looks out across the worst rioting in the nation's second largest city in a generation, in almost 30 years. His conclusion? We need far fewer police. It could have been better if they hadn't been there. Garcetti has announced he's going to cut funding for law enforcement. I want you to know we will not be increasing our police budget. How can we at this moment? Our city, through our city administrative officer, identify $250 million in cuts so we could invest in jobs, in health, in education, and in healing. 
and that those dollars need to be focused on our black community here in Los Angeles, as well as communities of color and women and people who have been left behind for too long. And will this involve cuts? Yes, of course, to every department, including the police department. When Democrats across the country start saying the same thing at the same time, you can be certain there's a reason for it. And in this case, they clearly mean it. According to the president of the LA Police Commission, city officials may cut $150 million from the LAPD. That would be more than 10% of the entire police budget in the wake of rioting. In New York, 48 separate Democratic candidates, and we're including in that the Manhattan District Attorney, signed a letter demanding a $1 billion cut to the budget of the NYPD. Why are they doing this? There are reasons, not the ones they tell you. They tell you it's about racism. They tell you that cops are racist and must be reined in. Most Americans don't agree with that. That's not the experience they have. In fact, police departments are one of the most trusted institutions in the country. According to Gallup polling last year, 53% of Americans said they had a great deal or quite a lot of confidence in the police. How many Americans trusted Congress? 11%. And in fact, most African Americans still support the police. A 2016 Pew poll found that 55% of African Americans had confidence in the police within their own communities. In other words, cops they actually knew and dealt with. They had confidence. A study by the Bureau of Justice Statistics from 2011 found that among those who called the police for help, more than 90% of African Americans felt the police behaved properly. So what would happen if we got rid of the police, of all law, and law enforcement? How would Americans feel if they actually defunded the police? Well, terrified, mostly. That's how we would feel. Things would fall apart instantly. It would take hours. Don't believe it? Spend an afternoon in a place with no law enforcement and see what you think. Talk to anyone who was in Baghdad at the height of the Iraq war. Ask anyone who stayed in New Orleans for Katrina. Their memories will be fresh. They'll never forget what they saw. Here's the key. Eliminating the police does not mean eliminating authority. There is always authority. There are no vacuums in nature. The only question is whether or not the authority is legitimate, whether or not the authority is accountable, whether or not you can do anything if the authority abuses its power. In the absence of law enforcement, the answer is no. It means thugs are in charge. The most violent people have the most power. They can do whatever they want to you. That's the reality. Everyone obeys the violent people or they get hurt. The mob literally rules. That probably sounds like a nightmare to you because it is. But the people pushing this idea don't see it as scary because they don't fear the mob, because they control the mob. That's the key. And they see violence as an instrument of their political power. With mobs in the streets that they control, they will finally get what they want. Donald Trump out of office and a hammerlock on the country. That's what's happening. John 15, 18 through 20. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. On a five to four vote, the United States Supreme Court recently rejected an appeal against California's restrictions on church gatherings during the COVID-19 crisis. A church in San Diego said Governor Newsom's restrictions infringed on religious freedom rights. But Chief Justice John Roberts and the court's four liberal justices say the U.S. Constitution entrusts, quote, the safety and health of the people to the politically accountable officials of the states to guard and protect. In other words, the governor can keep California churches closed. Well, joining us is the founder of Bikers for Christ and pastor of Rushing Wind Ministries in Oceanside, California, Fred Zarikny. So tell us, have you been holding parking lot services at your church despite the governor's order? Yes, we have. Um, just to uh, give you a real quick synopsis of what took place, you know, when, when we heard that churches... We're going to be allowed to open in three to six months, which sounded ridiculous to me. 
Um, we went ahead and decided to have our first service on May 3rd, uh, contacted the landlord, contacted the mayor, counted, contacted the county supervisor, just to let everybody know what we, we would be doing. We, we discussed it with my board. Uh, we decided that we were going to do a drive-in slash ride-in church service, invite everybody in the community. Um, the first one was a little bit out of control because we had set the chairs just up against the building. People came, took their chairs, put them wherever they wanted. And so there wasn't the social distancing that we had hoped for. So the next service, we set the chairs up for them, six feet apart, uh, told people that if they wanted to wear a mask, they could. If they wanted to stay in their car, they could. It was completely up to them. So uh, we also opened up our building, and we put a red cross on the floor every six feet so that people could walk in socially distance throughout the building, see what the building looks like, because... We were just, you know, it was so ridiculous that 7-Elevens are essential, abortion clicks, clinics are essential, vape shops are essential, and it just, I mean, it just seemed kind of crazy to me, liquor stores, everybody else, the big box stores, where people are a lot closer together than what we were doing, and I just said, you know what, we're, we need to obey God rather than men sometimes, as the apostles you know, so eloquently shared in the book of Acts. Tell us about that Pentecost Sunday service. I know that uh, some pastors, 1,200 actually, sent a letter to the governor prior to Pentecost Sunday, May 31st, saying yeah, it, they would open their churches regardless of the governor's shutdown. So what happened? Any fines, arrests? Uh, you know, I'm not sure. I know that the church in Chula Vista um, went through a lot of drama. They appealed to the Supreme Court. Um, I, I personally don't, don't know of other pastors in California that actually got arrested. Um, you know, I was waiting for whatever was going to go down. Okay. And, you know, like I said, we weren't trying to cause any trouble with anybody. We had Oceanside Police Department drive back and forth above our parking lot. And, you know, they just drove by. I almost felt like asking everybody to wave. We didn't do that. But, I mean, they didn't bother us at all. I have not been arrested. I have not been cited. None of the above. And, of course, we all have attorneys, if that takes place. Um, our, our ministry put together bail money just in case. But, you know, we, have, we haven't hit, been hit with any of that. I have a close friend that's from Maine, and his name is Ke Pastor Ken Graves, from Calvary Chapel of Bangor, Maine. He actually got cited, um, and his entire church said, we're practicing civil disobedience. We are gathering peacefully. We're not causing trouble. And I'm going to quote him because, you know, the, the reporter said, well, what will you do if law enforcement shows up? He said, and I quote, I will go with them. <laughs> Let me ask you this, because a lot of people say, look, uh, you know, even the Bible tells you to honor those that God puts in authority over you, members of the government, our government. So what do you say I to understand. people who say you're not honoring the government by opening? Well, here's, here's what I would say. When the disciples were told to not speak in the name of Jesus, then they had a d decision to make. Okay, so, you know, Governor Newsom actually adjusted his tyrannical, draconian edict on Memorial Day. And then he said that churches could open at 25% of their capacity, but it was limited to a, a maximum of 100 people. And so the other churches that are much larger than ours, if we opened inside our building at 25%, we would have been at about 30 people, okay? That still leaves 75% of the building that is wide open, and I'm like, okay, so, you know, we can actually do better in the parking lot. There is nothing more essential than God. There is nothing more essential to the world than the gospel of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, one through four, Paul declares what the gospel is and how important it is to embrace it and share it with others. 
He reminds the Corinthians of the gospel he preached among them, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. This is the essence of the gospel, the pure gospel of Jesus Christ, his death on the cross for sinners, and his resurrection to everlasting life is central to our Christian faith. 1 Corinthians 1.18 For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God! What if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready! Get ready! The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Time is short. Accept Jesus today.